Hello there and welcome. This is the lesson read aloud recording for lesson 2.08 Governing a New Nation. Make sure you go to lesson resources and get your reading guide and the lesson answer key and let's begin. Establishing a new nation wasn't easy. No one had created a government before. Americans were fearful of giving anyone power while they were still fighting to throw off a king and the states did not want to give up their own sovereignty. A committee of the Second Continental Congress worked for a year to produce a document that set up a loose alliance of states governed by a federal congress. That document was called the Articles of Confederation. It gave the states nearly all the power. Even so, it took almost four years to agree on a final version. But before long, the people realized that having a weak central government created a whole new set of problems. What should they do? And goals for today's lesson. Identify the Articles of Confederation as the first government of the United States. Analyze the strengths and weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation government. Give examples of the accomplishments and failures of the Articles of Confederation government. Identify the Articles of Confederation and the strengths and weaknesses. Assess the impa impact of the American Revolution and revolutionary thought on the people of the new United States. Explain how the United States was able to achieve victory in the Revolutionary War. Recognize the significance of state governments and a tradition of self-government in establishing the new government of the United States. Okay, and once again, don't forget to get your reading guide and lesson answer key, and let's begin. And we are going to start with reading on page 170 to 179. We also will be viewing the Northwest Ordinance Activity Online. Complete the Articles of Confederation Activity Online. And we are not doing the graded assignment. Remember this time around we are skipping the 2.08 graded assignment. Okay, let's start on page 170, and that's just the beginning of the chapter, Establishing a More Perfect Union. And here's a picture of a painting um, of the Constitutional Convention. And can you pick out some famous people here, right here? I believe that is to be Benjamin Franklin. That looks like a pretty accurate representation of what he looked like. And I imagine on this page here, that man standing up is supposed to be, who do you think? George Washington. All right, starting here on the establishing a more perfect union. In January 1780, as the ill-supplied Continental Army suffered through another bitter winter, George Washington penned a desperate letter to one of his generals. Our affairs are in so de deplorable a condition on the score of provisions, he wrote, as to fill the mind with the most anxious and alarming fears. Men have starved, imperfectly clothed, riotous and robbing the country people of their subs subsistence from sheer necessity. Despite repeated pleas, Washington could not secure adequate supplies from the Continental Congress. His men were almost perishing for want, he warned. They had been alternately without bread or meat. They are now reduced to an extremity no longer to be supported. Congress wanted to support Washington, but was powerless to come to his aid. The central government lacked the authority to raise taxes or regulate interstate and foreign trade. It could suggest that the states provide supplies, but not require them to do so. The problems Washington faced raised important questions about the identity of the newly independent American states. Were they simply a confederation, a loose alliance of separate states working together for limited purposes, or did they make up a single unified nation, the United States? Americans had fought the revolution to secure liberty and self-government, but by the mid-1780s it was impossible to ignore the weaknesses of a government unable to solve a host of problems, including a mass of debt, clashes between large and small states over border issues, and uprisings against local authorities. Foreign powers looked on with sometimes greedy eyes, expecting the new republic to collapse at any moment. Having won their independence, Americans faced the task of shaping a government that could both protect liberty and achieve long-lasting stability, a huge challenge since history suggested that republics in past times were vulnerable to ambitious dictators or aggressive foreign powers. New questions, Ameri new questions faced Americans lead America's leaders. Should they establish a strong or weak central government? How should power be distributed between states and the federal government? In short, what kind of republic should the Americans create? And here's just a little excerpt about the Great Seal. Read that on your own time. But we're going to go on. It's interesting information, of course, but I'm just going to start with the content reading. Government under Articles of Confederation. In June 1776, even before the colonies formally declared independence from Great Britain, the Second Continental Congress authorized a committee to draw up guidelines for a new central government, the Articles of Confederation. Oh, I read that wrong. There's a period there, not a comma. The Articles of Confederation passed in November 1777 were not formally adopted until March 
1781, when Maryland became the 13th and final state to approve them. For all practical purposes, the Articles provided the basic governing structure from late 1777 through 1787, 10 years. Under the Articles of Articles of Confederation, the 13 states established a perpetual union and a firm league of friendship for their common defense and mutual and general welfare. Despite all this talk of togetherness, officially each state remained independent and each retained a sovereignty, that is, each had the power to run its own affairs. Governing this loose confederation was a central Congress, with no chief executive but the president of the Congress, whose powers were limited. In effect, his job was merely to preside over meetings of the Congress. In the United States today, Congress is bicameral. It has two chambers, which means two lawmaking bodies, the Senate and the House of Representatives. Under the Articles of Confederation, Congress was unicameral. It had only one legislative chamber. Each state sent a delegation of up to seven congressmen, but congressmen did not cast individual votes. Instead, each state had one vote. The Confederation Congress had some important powers. It could declare war negotiate with foreign countries and Native American tribes and nations, settle disputes between the states, borrow money, regulate the army, and manage the post office, but it lacked the authority to tax or to regulate commerce. It could not require men to serve in the Continental Army, but only suggest that each state provide a certain number of troops. It could recommend that states pay their, pay their fair share to feed and clothe the army and finance the national government. But it lacked the power of the purse, the power to raise and spend money, which kept it weak and subject to the will of the states. The Articles of Confederation required nine states to pass any measure. To amend any part of the Articles, all 13 states had to agree. It was difficult to achieve such an agreement, which created major headache for the leaders of the new government. Why did the Americans give their new government such limited powers? In part, in part because they distrusted a strong central authority, which they associated with the tyranny of the British King and Parliament. Moreover, most Americans wanted to keep power closer to home, in the hands of state and town governments. They agreed that 13 states must be united to win the war against Britain. They understood the need for the states to work together in various ways after the war. But wary of the possibility of tyranny, almost everyone remained suspicious of a strong central government. Accomplishments of the Confederation Government Despite the problems of the Articles of Confederation, the new government did manage to accomplish some important undertakings. First and foremost, it conducted a successful war for independence, with members of Congress, who, with members of Congress often creatively improvising to reach their goals. For example, in 1781, when the Young Republic faced economic ruin, the Confederation Congress appointed Robert Morris, a wealthy Philadelphia merchant and congressman, as superintendent of finance. He established a national bank and encouraged private investors to deposit gold and silver, the most reliable and widely accepted forms of money. With these deposits in the banks, Morris was able to buy on credit the provisions so sorely needed by the Continental Army. It was Morris who came to George Washington's rescue in 1781 and almost single-handedly funded the troops in the desperate winter before Yorktown. At the end of the Revolution, the new government negotiated highly favorable peace terms with Britain. The Treaty of Paris, 1783, required Britain to recognize the United States as a sovereign country, with the western border stretching all the way to the Mississippi River. This is no small achievement on the part of America's official negotiators, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and John Jay. The post-war Confederation, post Confederation Congress, though weak, also passed some of the most important legislation approved by the, any American Congress. It developed a plan for the orderly settlement of the land north and west of the Ohio River. This area, known as the Northwest Territory, included all land west of Pennsylvania, east of the Mississippi River, and north of the Ohio River. After the war, Americans rushed into the Northwest Territory, but there was no plan to sell the land or incorporate the unsettled territories as states. In the Land Ordinance of 1785, the Confederation Congress took action, dividing the territory into separate townships of six miles square and creating an orderly process for cheaply selling and distributing the land. The ordinance also required that one lot in each township be set aside to support a public school. The Northwest Ordinance of 1787 provided for the eventual establishment of new states in the region, which eventually became Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, and Wisconsin. This act ensured basic civil rights such as freedom of religion and the right to trial by jury. jury. <clears throat> Eager to avoid conflict with the Native Americans of the region, Congress prohibited the seizure of Indian lands without compensation. Congress also took its first step toward limiting the expansion of slavery. The Northwest Ordinance of 1787 banned slavery in the territory north of the Ohio River. 
Most importantly, the Northwest Ordinance set up a process for a territory to become a state and recognize that all new states would enter the Union on an equal footing with the original states in all respects whatsoever. The ordinance defined an initial stage of settlement during which a territory's governing officials would be appointed by Congress. Once the population of a territory reached 5,000 free adult males, freeholders could elect represent representatives to a territorial assembly. When the population reached 60,000, the population of the smallest state at the time, a territory could apply for statehood with a constitution based on any of the previous state models. This system ensured that the original states would not attempt to take on imperial powers and treat the new territories as colonies. The Northwest Ordinance established an important precedent for the rapidly expanding American frontier. Years later, it also provided anti-slavery advocates with an important legal precedent as they debated whether to allow slavery in new parts of the expanding territory. And here's just a map of the original 13 colonies in green, the Northwest Territories in that tannish brown, and disputed territory is um, in that yellow and the orange showing us Spanish Florida and Spanish Louisiana which we had later uh, purchased with the Louisiana Purchase and then of course Canada they're still controlled by the British okay and then here's just an excerpt from the Northwest Ordinance that that primary source document uh, I'm not going to read through it but you can look at it on your own time Post-war troubles. In the aftermath of the peace treaty that ended the American Revolution, the new problems arose that exposed the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. What problem had to do with the treatment of Loyalists, or Tories? The peace treaty called on the states to restore the property of Loyalists who had fled their homes when the British retreated. By some, <clears throat> by some estimates, up to one-fifth of Americans had sided with the English during the war, and as many as 80,000 resettled in Canada or Britain, some temporarily, others never to return. Many Americans were reluctant to let the Loyalists come home to resume their lives. Even cool-headed leaders such as Benjamin Franklin denounced the Loyalists as mongrels and fratricides. A fratricide is one who kills his own brother. See that little definition on the side? Since Congress had no authority to enforce the peace treaty, many states refused to restore confiscated land and property to the Loyalists. The British, seeing this refusal as an American violation of the peace treaty, felt justified in ignoring some of their obligations under the treaty. In particular, they ignored the treaty's requirement that they remove all British troops and forts from the Northwest Territory. Oh, this might be problems down the road, right, ladies and gentlemen? Congress sat helpless as British military garrisons encouraged Indian tribes in the Northwest to attack American settlers. Congress was also powerless to stop Spain from closing the Mississippi River to American trade. Closing the Mississippi was a major problem for the many Americans pushing into the Western territories between Florida and the Ohio River, hoping to find better land and new economic opportunities. Without access to the Mississippi, these pioneers could not move their agricultural products to sea. Americans also faced huge financial problems. During the war, both Congress and the states printed paper money, but soon the millions of paper dollars in circulation had no gold or silver to back them up. This led to inflation, a steady rise in prices, as the value of paper money fell sharp, sharply and eventually became almost worthless. The expression, not worth a continental dollar, was widely used to describe anything lacking value. The Confederation government had no way of paying back the vast sums of money it had borrowed from European nations and private lenders during the war. Foreign governments could only agree to lend America, America more money until at enormous rates of interest. To make matters worse, the states began feuding among themselves, and Congress could do nothing to stop them. New York and Rhode Island argued over trading rights. Connecticut and Pennsylvania argued over who owned the region that present-day Wilkes Bar in Scranton. While not squibbling with the Connecticut, with Connecticut, Pennsylvania was also engaged in a bitter land dispute with Virginia, just like fighting kids. Given these conditions, it was little wonder that many members of Congress did not even bother to show up for work. Often, Congress could not convene for lack of a quorum. Many delegates doubted whether the central government existed in anything but name. One congressman from Connecticut wondered whether we have a Congress or no. The situation is truly deplorable. And we'll stop this video here since it's almost to the 15 minute mark and we'll pick up um, in part two video.